to remember 20 years ago. How about folks that aren't the big stars? Do you feel more freedom? Uh, somewhat, but honestly, they want to look good too. So there's a certain amount of retouching that goes into that. And the eye is a funny thing. You can trick the eye pretty easily. If you just don't go overboard and you don't make everything perfect in a picture, the eye will adjust. And recently I just worked with a, a local personality here, Reggie Bibbs, who's uh, with NF, with the Neurofibromatosis Society. And he's fairly disfigured from this disorder. And we just did some pictures the other day, very wonderful pictures at his home. And we've worked together for 20 years. And I retouched, he says, I don't want to really have much retouch, Greg. And I went in and just did a little bit of work. And the eye adjusts because it's not an overkill. It's right. not going in and just doing too much work. And that's kind of how I try to approach most pictures, to keep them within the realm of credibility. So are you a journalist when you take photos or are you an artist? Um, I would say more of an artist because I think a journalist would put yourself in the context of not retouching and actually absolutely capturing what is real. And uh, today, as you know very well, so many journalists have come under scrutiny because of the fact that certain things have been removed from a picture and right. it ceases to be journalism at that point. But by the very nature of where you put a camera, you can also say, well, that's not really a journalistic picture because that camera angle actually has a point of view. Right. Take me all the way back. As I understand, you go to a concert, you're snapping pictures, and this is how this all began. Yeah, in the early days, uh, I was living in Kansas City and going to school, and uh, I had third row center seats for a Jimi Hendrix concert. And a good buddy of mine that I used to go hunting and fishing with in Kansas City loaned me his camera. I said, what should I set the camera? What should I do? And he said, oh, put it at F5.6 at, uh, let's say, 125th of a second, and you'll get a picture. Well, when the pictures came back, they were a little soft. We processed them the next morning in his dark room, and when I saw them coming up in the tray, I was kind of hooked. And we've kind of come full circle today because now I'm back in control of my vision once again and basically interpreting my own images, whereas for so many years I allowed labs to make my prints, and uh, but now I make all my own prints and do all my own work. All these pictures in here I've printed. Because you're a big proponent, too, of the digital photography. And I wonder, because a lot of people will swear by film, it's not real if it's the digital, but they've come a very long way. Well, I think what people, there's several factors that you can look at from this point of view. One is fear of the unknown. So people are afraid to make that transition. And today, you know, everything is automatic, autofocus, autoexposure. But if you look at the big picture and you go back in time and you go back to the days of like daguerreotypes and amber types and glass plate negatives and then silver prints and then platinum palladium prints, it's basically we're living at a time where we're seeing the evolution of photography change. And I think in, in not in a bad way. Before you went to that Jimi Hendrix show, ever fascinated by the image? Was there a particular posters you had in your room, something that really moved you or did it all come alive at that moment? It really was kind of the day of reckoning, I should say. When I saw the uh, images coming up in the developer, I was like, wow. And the next uh, semester, it was my second semester in college, I enrolled in actually, ironically, a photojournalism course because that's the only photography courses they had at the University of Kansas. Is there fear in being taught this kind of art or is there something about the natural instinct that just comes from understanding a picture? I think you can teach the art of photography. I don't think you can train a person's eye. I think you either have it or you don't have it. You can learn the technical part, but I mean, so many people today think they can just pick up a camera and become a photographer. <clears throat> and the ones that I think really become successful are people that inherently do have a good eye. But there's so many people out there today taking pictures. And if you go to a lot of these big shows, you know, I go to a lot of the shows, everything is big and everything's gotta be bigger and bigger is better. And unless the content's there, it really isn't. Yeah. You know, just because it's a big print doesn't make it a, a great picture. But a great picture in a big print, then, is just overwhelming. I mean, I look at in the gallery that we're in right now, and you look at these images that I've seen before in books or in magazines, and when you see them put up on the wall, in the frame, there's something so beyond just an image. What do you think that is? Well, uh, hopefully it's uh, the fact that I've connected with most of these subjects and gotten them to trust me by winning over their confidence and trust. Because doing you know, personality portraits, it's like these people shedding their clothes for you because they're not playing a character other than themselves. And sometimes it's a day of reckoning when they're trying to figure out who exactly they're supposed to be. And not shedding their clothes. We're going to get to that in a little oh, bit. But go. I want to take you back. Jim Morrison. So you got to shoot him also, but these are all concert, concert shootings. Pictures. So it's not that you had a chance, but you still capture that intimacy with them. Why is that? I can understand if you're in a studio and you get to know someone, and you're setting it up and you're talking with them and you're understanding them. But just in a moment on stage, what do you think it is that you have that grabs that? I don't know. I couldn't really answer it. I think I just, I mean, I really kind of locked down on the person and it's trying to find that right moment. I mean, I think a lot of it is the right moment. When I'm shooting and I'm doing like one of the commission, uh, uh, portraits that you see here, uh, a lot of times it's just spending time talking. I'll get them into a body language. Body language is so important. A body language in a picture 
If I was to show you and I lean this way and you're taking my picture, I'm confident. Watch what happens to my head when it turns. You see how it lost the control? <laughs> Even if I was yeah. posed for you this way, and, I, and, this, and, and this is how we're going to shoot me, I'm in control. Watch what happens when the body language changes this way, just a little bit. So a lot is just shape, form, and balance. It's a big part of, of what goes into the image. It's not just this. It's kind of all the elements and components that go together. When do you realize this can actually be a career? Well, it's interesting because what happened is I moved to California um, after my second year of college. My parents were divorced when I was young. My dad lived in L.A. and I came out and I ended up going to film school um, at a certain time in my life, just around that time, I met a gentleman from uh, Eastman Kodak named Larry Stevenson, and he said, unless you want to become a tech rep, he said, you really know enough about photography, Greg. Why don't you pursue film? So I went to film school at USC, got out of there, realized that my only real connection and interest and motivation with photography was people. It was always about shooting people. Never could, yeah. I couldn't shoot something that doesn't talk back to me. I could never shoot a tin can or tabletop photography. I had no interest. I, I, I would be lost. Landscapes, anything? No? No. And as, the irony is I was, in one of my lectures that I give, I show pictures. And generally, if I go somewhere and I'm traveling, I want to find a person to shoot within the environment. And that I like. But I won't really just go out and take snapshots of beautiful landscapes and all. I, if I do, which occasionally happens, and it's generally with a little point-and-shoot camera, they just get... They get backed up and take a lot of storage on my excerpt, but uh, kind of a waste. You've gone to film school. Film school isn't working for you. How do we get to the still photography as a career? Well, the reason the film school didn't really take it, and it's an interesting uh, uh, comment from you, because when I got out of film school, it was all about, it wasn't about a great camera take. It was about a great acting take. And being the control freak that I have always been and <laughs> continue to be, I liked that one-on-one -on -one communication with the people that I was shooting. For me, that was a lot more important. So that took me back to my roots of, of photography. And basically, with what I'd learned and incorporated in, in going to film school, I was working with hard, hard lights. You know, I was working with, uh, and I didn't have the money to buy strobes back then. So my first lights that I used to shoot with was like a little 2K softbox and some 1K areas. And that's how I started to learn how to light and, and, and do what I do. And a lot of people take photography to mean the camera and the image, and they forget about lighting, where lighting is really such an important part of it. Well, it's really the most important. The two big things when I'm teaching my workshops is that I basically teach people how to see light how to interpret light and how to communicate with the talent. Because you can, you know, analyze a face and figure out, you know, well, the light should be here to shade this or open this up or take it down like we were talking about earlier. At the same time, if you and I don't get a banner going and you don't trust me, like if you, if you don't trust me or you don't feel comfortable with me, it doesn't matter how fabulous I made you light, I made the lighting look, we're not going to communicate. We're not going to get that connected portrait. And that's a really big part, I think, of, of what I do. I think it's a lot of time when I'm uh, doing my shoots at the studio, if I don't know the talent at this point, I'm so old, I've been doing it so long, I know most of the people I've shot, I shoot. But I still, once in a while, I'll get somebody in there, and I'm not so sure. And I never follow <clears throat> whatsoever what anybody else has to say about someone. I'm not interested. For me to come in with a, a point of view that is colored based upon uh, someone else's opinion or something that someone's written is, is not fair to that person either. So I usually, prior to a shoot, will sit down in the makeup room, if that's where I am, and just chit-chat them up and, and kind of watch what's going on and just try to get a basis for to establish a level of communication where we can connect. You're a photographer. You're out of school. You've got the equipment. You understand it. What was the breaking point that got you into a career? Uh, I was very fortunate, actually, and one of the first people that really gave me some of my very early breaks was a, a, a wonderful person named Barbara DeWitt, who was the, the late sister of Bruce Weber. And she ran a, a PR firm in L.A., kind of a managerial PR firm, and she represented some great people that I loved. I was shooting a lot of rock and roll concerts. Some of the pictures were being published in local magazines, and I started uh, working. And she gave me early on in my career people like David Bowie and, and, and the sort to shoot. And this started helping. My big break, I'd say, really came with Interview Magazine. It was one of the first uh, publications that really helped launch my career with Andy. And, you know, there's a lot of pictures of Andy in the show. But working, shooting covers for Interview Magazine, getting to do layouts where they let the photographer do what they wanted. They didn't dictate. They would give us the star, and they'd say, shoot. And we'd do these great environmental portraits and have fun with it. And that, you know, getting published and getting the pictures out there, that helped really launch my career. My LA Works campaign was a big yeah. uh, part of helping me with my career early on in my career. And, and so much success depends on, on how lucky and how fortunate you are to ha be in the right place at the right time and get the right people, regardless of your talent. There's so many talented people that never get there. But I had Streisand early on, Bette Midler early on, Dustin Hoffman and Tootsie. That was a big break. Yeah. Big chill, Scarface. You know, getting those movies at the beginning of my career helped Put every, you know, once you have that under your belt, then everything else kind of falls in line. People go, oh, well, he shot this one, he did that one. I was very, very lucky. I saw you <clears> speaking <throat> about 
having confidence when you meet the person you're going to shoot because they're going to be unsure, nervous. Totally. These are these images that are going to live for a very long time. So if you show them confidence, then they'll have confidence in you. So true. As a young guy, just out starting off and getting those big names, did you have that confidence even then? Not at the beginning. And it's, it's a great question because how it really kind of came about <clears throat> was that early on in my career, I was shooting people, I was doing portraits actually for a, a theater arts magazine called After Dark out a million years ago. Shooting people like Michelle Phillips, Dennis Christopher, Tom Skerritt, Tony Perkins. And sometimes I would be thinking things while I was doing the shoot that came into my mind, right? And I wouldn't make a comment about them, wouldn't say anything. And then I'd see the contact sheets come back from the lab and I'd go, right when I'm looking at it, I wish I'd said something. So I realized yeah. one of the most important things I had to offer uh, the people that I photographed was my brutal honesty, just to be really upfront and share my vision with them while I was working. I always shared the Polaroids. I always show the capture on the camera because then they start to understand. They can't, you know, like if I'm shooting you, you don't really can't understand what I'm doing if I don't share it with you. If I share my vision with you, then you can kind of understand where, where we need to meet, where you, you either need to come up to the plate a little bit more for me or I need to kind of move around and figure out how to get it to work between us. And but so a lot that's of photographers don't like that. They don't want... Yeah you interfering with my work. I'm the artist. I've been hired to shoot you. Look Very at my work. So. I know what to do. Who are you to tell me? Totally. So how do you then make sure that what you're doing doesn't impede on your art and your vision, but can still satisfy your client? It's a fine line. It's a very yeah. fine line. There's times when it does. Um, it's generally not from the talent. If it's from the talent, then it's a talent that just has a totally unrealistic point of view. And at that point, I don't give it's just like, you know, you know, if that's where you're going, then you know what? I, I've lost interest because if I can't convince or convey to you how I see something, I'm always willing to go play both sides of the fence. I'll shoot it your way. Let's get it. But then give me a shot at how I see it. And you know what? I may be the winner at the end of the day or they may. But if I don't have the opportunity to shoot the vision that I see, then, you know, who's going to never, ever really know at the end of the day where the best picture lays? Yeah. When your first book came out, intimidating, awesome, worrisome for you. Here is something beyond just the momentary magazine, periodicals, movie posters. Here's something that is fine art. What's your reaction to the first book? Well, it was fun. It actually came about over a conversation in London. I was having, a, I was at a party with some people, some of the uh, kids from Duran Duran, and actually Mike Worla, who was handling, uh, I think, the PR marketing for Duran Duran, said, you know, it would be great to do a book. And I hadn't really thought about it, but I I, it was at a point where my career was getting fairly established at the early part of my career. And I said, sure, let's do it. And it just kind of came out of nowhere and went back, got with a very good friend of mine that's a very talented art director to do the kind of design and layout, and we put it together. Worried at that moment you're not picking the right pieces. How do you decide of your body of work what's going in a book? Um, well, at that point, I, it's weird. I'm probably more worried and more concerned today Really? In terms of the pictures, whether I made the right choices, whether uh, the pictures that I chose best represent what I want to say. And generally, I've, I'm a very, I know I'm a very good editor, and I've always been a good editor, but I did a couple of kind of challenging wild books, you know, a, a couple of the male uh, nude books I did. And those I actually got art directors to do the layout and design on. I wanted to step back from it because the work was a little bit personal, and I felt that I couldn't be as objective as I should be for a project mm -hmm. like that. So it's, you know, it, it, it's a give and take situation. The first book or two, I think, you know, you're young, you're a kid, you're in my 30s, and it's like, you know, hey, you know, we'll figure this <laughs> out, you know. And I think as it gets further down the road, you kind of uh, open up and you kind of realize, you know, maybe a fresh eye is good for this. Yeah. Before we get to from that point yeah. of your life, Orson Welles, I, I need to go there because that, it's a beautiful shot and really captures this man as we know him. Well, it was interesting. Unfortunately, I can't take a lot of credit for that or my Hitchcock picture because I went to film school, as I was, as you know, uh, at USC, and we had this amazing class that Arthur Knight, who wrote Sex and Cinema column for Playboy magazine for 100 yeah. years, had, we had a class with him. It was a regular enrolled class called Thursday Night at the Movies. And every Thursday night, I mean, it was unbelievable. Orson Welles would come down, Alfred Hitchcock would come down. I mean, they <laughs> all were there, Robert Altman. <clears throat> and they'd present their movie, and then there'd be a discussion afterwards. Uh, with with Orson Welles, it was his last movie. It was fake. And uh, we actually sat after the screening. A few of us that were privy to being with him that Arthur kind of chose. We were all sat in the classroom. He sat on a desk in the classroom and just uh, talked and answered questions. So, I mean, I, did, I met him other than to say, hey, how are you? And I'm just snapping pictures. Are there things you think that are taught wrong in school when it comes to this art form? Well, not being in that position today, it's hard for me to say. I teach 
pretty much right. full time. I teach a lot now. I spend most of my time now teaching and making wine. That's kind of my, my and life making these wine? days. Yeah, those are my two <laughs> big uh, deals these days. But uh, I think the most interesting classes for photography today are actually classes, not just like I'm teaching, but classes that are workshops as opposed to going in there. I don't think you're going to learn how to be a photographer from a textbook. I think you've got to basically apply everything in a real world situation, not in an ideal protected situation. You got to go out. I got to take you out today. We've got to shoot outside. We're on location. It's pouring down rain. There's no light. What are we going to do? Not, you know, this is how you do the picture. This is how you light the pictures. This is what you do. It's being able to apply yourself in the real world. And that's how photography needs to be taught because it's, it's a question of if you have an eye, it can be developed if the eye is there. It needs to be trained. And you, the training comes from life experiences. Are you any good with a point and shoot? I love point and shoots. Yeah, I mean, I haven't tried to do the artsy fartsy point and shoot stuff, but I shouldn't even say that. My book on uh, Greg was actually all shot with a point and shoot camera. Did you ever see that book? Yeah. Yeah. Just between us, or as my first assistant said, not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was that whole book was actually shot with a point and shoot camera. And the context of that book and the, how that book came about was, I was just snapping pictures of my partner at the time, and he was had modeling, great looking. And I thought, wow, this is wild. This is Greg Gorman without reflectors, without two assistants, without hair and makeup, without an entourage, just between us, the two of us. So that was kind of the, and that was all point and shoot. Yeah. How do you think that work holds up to other work of yours? Um, I love the book. For me, uh, I mean, it's not this kind of classic portraiture, although there's some there. I feel strongly about the book. I mean, for me, it was something I wanted to do. I mean, you know, I got a lot of flack about it because people said, oh, this is going to kill your career. You shouldn't do this book. Um, I was at a point in my career, I mean, as a book that I wanted to do. So as an artist, to do something outside of the realm of stuff that people expect to see, I think was good. Yeah. And I think it captured the essence of... It, obviously, our relationship was not positioned in the book, but the fact of just the... Camera capturing him in spontaneous moments rather than setups, I thought was kind of interesting. Yeah. When you do talk about all this, of course, we got to bring up the nudes. Where is the line, do you feel, between what, and a lot of people get worried, as soon as they hear it's a nude, they're starting to think it must be pornography. What for you is the line? Um, I think pornography can only really be defined in the eyes of the beholder, because in reality, what is pornography? I mean, you can look at a pornographic picture and, and probably find an argument or a point of view that makes it a piece of fine art. Um, I personally, I don't think there really is such a thing as pornography. I think that one, I think, you know, religious zealots obviously like to lock into those things. And I, and one of the things that I said when I published the book on, on, uh, Greg, uh, the book I did just between us is that the first people that are con going to condemn this book, particularly in America where there's, there's so much more hypocritical are the first people that'll be behind a closed door looking at it. And I mean, that's just so <laughs> typical. So it, uh, pornography is a tough one to define, I think. Harder or easier to photograph someone naked? Do they, are they easier to work with? Is there a fear and anxiety within them that then you can take advantage of as a photographer if they come in all suited up? Is it going to be a different experience? What do you find? Well, it's certainly uh, a more difficult uh, situation to shoot. Uh, not difficult in terms of the fact that they're nude, but you've got a lot more elements to deal with in the picture as opposed to... And well, how I came into shooting nudes was that the basic big part of my career was I was doing all this work, I was becoming successful, and I saw a dear friend of mine long ago passed away, Antonio Lopez, who's a fashion illustrator in New York, one of the great ones. He said, well, what are you doing for you, Greg? What are you shooting? And I thought, I'm not doing anything. I'm just, you know, making money and shooting this commercial work. And so he said, well, something you should think about. So I thought about the idea of maintaining my style of lighting, my strong highlights and hard shadows, but pull the camera back and let's lose the clothes. And that's really how my nude started. So working with people in that realm, people generally, when they come in front of my camera for the first time naked, if I haven't shot them, like anything else, they're, they're nervous for maybe five or 10 minutes. And then after that, the robes don't even go back on. They're walking <laughs> through the studio, walking up the stairs. You know, it's just, it's, it's just that instant moment of let's see what's right. going on. Once they start, it all calms down. And it's also developing a relationship and a banner. When you talk about, too, the shadows and all of that, what I think of is then the move from color to black and white photography. And black and white seems to be pretty much a big emphasis of your work. What is it that black and white gives you that color doesn't? I think it just strips everything bare and really gets down to the basic elements of the photograph. And I think that color oftentimes can camouflage a photograph. And I've, I've always loved black and white. And I must say that probably one of the instrumental factors in me really pursuing black and white was my early work for interview, because it was some of my early really strong pictures. And... Uh, I like, I like the relationship of light and how the interplay in, in, in the highlights to shadows works more in uh, black and white than color. Because if you notice in my pictures, I don't really have so many midtones. It's generally highlights and shadows. Yeah. You know, it's not about what I try to say in the highlights. It's what I don't say in the shadows. It hopefully brings you into the picture and leaves you wanting to know more about a picture, which I think often makes a picture more successful. You have a thing on your website about dual tones? Oh, and... I have a way to do a black and white conversion because now shooting digital, everything's color. 
Yeah. Do you, yeah. when you're capturing these images, then are you following that same guideline of taking the picture over? Or do you set your camera to do black and white? Imagery? Oh, no. Very good question. A lot of people ask me that. Um, no, I always capture in color. Um, one of the things I try to teach when I'm teaching is, is training your eye to see in black and white, even though you're capturing in color, realizing what the different tonalities are going to be and which ones you need to avoid because they're going to be too close to skin tone, so you keep the contrast. But I, I want to have all the information in my file, even though today you can capture and do a tone if you're shooting raw. It's probably getting way too technical for you guys. <laughs> and you can still look at the actual capture in color when you go into camera raw to process the file. Okay, before we run out of time, just a couple people have to ask about sure. shooting Grace Jones. I mean, you've done some amazing images of that woman. Is she as scary as she seems? <laughs> you know, there's not a scary bone in that woman's body, except for the party aspect. She is not. She's one of my dear friends. I just saw her very recently. She's an amazing person, and she's been a dear friend for well over a good 30-some years. And she's just incredible. She's not really tall. She's not as larger than life than you think. She is so much fun. She's great. She's awesome to work with. She's like really understands the camera, the angles. The big joke among her best friends in LA, because she can party, is that, but, and she's calmed down. I must say she's chilled, <laughs> but she, everybody's line was, everybody's happy to see, see Grace come and even happier to see her go because she wears you <laughs> out. She can go and go and go, but she's an awesome person. So if yeah. she's not that tall, not that scary, no. not that severe, what no. is it that she has that comes across in these images that are yeah. so striking? She has an incredible uh, relationship with the camera and the way she can connect and communicate. And she knows herself inside and out and she's not afraid to show it. And I think, you know, that kind of confidence and also her insane sense of style and how every designer loves her. And, you know, she gets the greatest clothes. I think in that one, I think it's like Terry Mugler. She always has like the best stuff to wear. And the, she's just, you know, she's ideal for a uh, photography. She's a great subject. Yeah. What makes someone beautiful in your eyes? Confidence. Confidence. General, not always confidence. I mean, I think confidence will give you the sex appeal. I think sometimes actually the exact opposite can give you some of the beauty, some of the naivete, some of the people that are not even aware of how beautiful they are. That essence can also, so it can work both ways. It's interesting because it's kind of a give and take. It can work either way. Sometimes naiveness, there's, there's yeah. a couple people I'm shooting now that I don't think perceive themselves as beautiful at all. And they're just exquisite because there's this innocence there that's extraordinary. Can you alter that? Can you change someone by how you present them in a photo? And have you done that? Sure. Who would I mean, be well, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, I think that you can always kind of mix things up. I mean, we did with Bet many years ago um, when a lot of the work that Bet had done was very uh, more up tempo and, and fun and body. And Bet, when we did Bet for interview, we took it totally the other direction, went to a very inner reflective, more soul searching side of Bet, which is really who she is if you know her in person. She's funny, right. but she's much more of a prude than most people realize. You know, <laughs> the, the persona of how you see people is not always who these people really are in real life, they're very different. Is it ever hard if somebody comes with such an image that's known and you realize from meeting them they aren't that image, but you've been sent to photograph for a magazine, let's say, and that's what you need to capture is that image. Is that hard to do? Is it hard to get them to be in your style? Do well, it? it's a good question. One of the things that's interesting is that today, I mean, I don't do so much editorial work anymore like I used to. My relationships with the talent are much, are much more important uh, to me than uh, trying to get something that may be the flip side of how the people want to see themselves uh, personified. I had just had this not very long ago with Parade magazine with a big story on Elton John and I went down to shoot and I mean I had a row with Parade, brutal. And they wanted this kind of picture and that kind of picture and it was a story on on his AIDS foundation. And uh, I went down and I, I think I thought I delivered some really good pictures and I think they wanted, you know, the flip flippant, you know, quirky side of Elton, which wasn't really in the context of what we were doing. I thought if they want those pictures, then get stage pictures of Elton. We went right. in and did it totally other side and I didn't give them to him. Is there somebody, as we, as we wrap this up, somebody you still want to shoot you haven't gotten in front of your lens? There's a few. You know who I really would love to photograph? Bridget Bardot. And she kind of knows it, but we've never we've never met. But uh, I, Even though she looks the way she looks today, I just always, as a child growing up, she was one of my big <laughs> fantasies. And I just think she's kind of an amazing person. Well, thank you so much for sitting down and talking thank you. with us. Thank you. So nice to meet you. So many fantasies and so many images. Greg Gorman. Thank you. To order a DVD of this or any episode of Interviews, please visit HoustonPBS.org.